In military hardware, there are some objects that become icons. They achieve fame and recognition for their impact on the battlefield and the sheer length of their operational service. This is one of them, the AK-47 designed by Mikhail Kalashnikov. 60 years after its creation, it is still in use by regular and irregular forces across the globe. And if you had to name one tank worthy of the title Kalashnikov on tracks, it would surely be this, the T-54-55 series. With its origins in World War II and from the same design team as the legendary T-34, the T-54-55 still soldiers on today around the third world. Just about every aspect has been modified or upgraded. And while it couldn't hope to hold its own against a modern main battle tank, it is still a real threat in many of today's lower level conflicts. So we're here at the Muckleborough Collection to take a closer look at this very significant machine and to understand just what made it into the most produced and one of the most longest serving tanks ever. The T-54 story starts with its designer, Alexander Morozov. He was part of the T-34 design team headed by Mikhail Koshkin, working on the transmission. But when Koshkin died suddenly in September 1940, Morozov took over. All efforts at the time were concentrating on getting the T-34 into service and over time upgrading it. But Germany's Panther had come at a nasty shock at the Battle of Kursk, leading to the upgunning of the T-34 to 85 mm and a natural question, what next? Morozov and his team faced the constant problem of tank design, the trade-offs between armour, mobility and firepower. How to make a more effective medium tank than the T-34 without increasing the size and, in turn, of course, the weight. Morozov solved this in a very ingenious and effective way by totally reorganising the interior layout. He got rid of the whole machine gunner, creating more storage for the larger ammunition. He turned the engine crosswise and placed the transmission behind it at the rear of the hull, driving the rear sprockets. This freed up more space for the fighting compartment and storage. On top of this, he used torsion bar suspension, which took up a lot less internal space than the old Christie suspension of the T-34. The first result of this thinking was the T-43 and then the T-44. The T-44 has significantly thicker armour than the T-34, but with a better ride and better cross-country performance. But it still needed more than the 85mm gun, which, of course, the T-34 already had. So development focused on increasing the size of the gun and, of course, designing a turret ring enough to take them. A 100mm gun was trialled and even 122mm. The decision was finally taken to go ahead with the 100mm calibre and two prototypes with the designation T44-100 were built, one with the 100mm D10 gun, the other with the LB-1 gun. The D10 had already proved itself in the SU-100 tank destroyer. So with a redesigned turret, a new V54 engine and new steering, the tank went into production in 1945 as the T-54. But even redesigned, the turret was still a problem, with poor ammunition storage and dangerous shot traps. So it's changed yet again, this time to a turret similar to that of the IS-3 heavy tank, with a hemispherical shape and no awkward shot traps at the sides. Throughout the late 1940s and 1950s, the T-54 was progressively upgraded in just about all areas. But by the mid-1950s, it was clear that more had to be done to protect the tank from nuclear and biological attack. So to achieve this, a major upgrade entered production in 1958, called the T-55.
It incorporated all the detailed improvements made today and also had a more powerful V55 engine and, over time for later variants, yet more improvements. Stabilizers for the gun, better ammunition, improved fire control and sighting and, later on, extra protection in the form of reactive armour. So let's take a closer look at this example, a Czech-built T55. Looking at this next to a T-34 shows just how clever Morisov was. The hull is just a little wider than the T-34-85, but about the same length. More importantly, the overall height is a lot less, presenting a lower profile to enemy fire. But despite this, it has thicker armour and mounts a bigger gun. Its armour is pretty good. With 200mm on the turret front, 125 millimetres to 150 millimetres on the turret sides and 120 millimetres on the hull front and also 80 millimetres on the hull sides. But just as important, the shallow slope of the front glasses and the smooth rounded turret not only give the tank a very low silhouette but increase the effective thickness of the armour and help to deflect incoming shells. The gun is a 100 millimetre D10T with a rifle barrel Note the fume extractor near the muzzle. This had a rate of fire between four and seven rounds per minute, with a maximum effective range of two and a half thousand meters. Looking at it from the sides, the first thing to spot is the uneven spacing of the road wheels, with a large gap between the first and second wheels. This is unique to the T5455. Suspension, as mentioned earlier, is torsion bar with a separate torsion bar for each wheel running across the tank. The tracks are wider than those of the T-3485, 580 millimetres instead of 500 millimetres, which means that the ground pressure is actually slightly less than its predecessors, even though the tank's weight is about four tonnes more. As I said before, the dry sprockets are now at the rear. Under here is the really clever bit. The engine is mounted crosswise, now, of course, we're so used to this nowadays in cars that it may seem a bit ordinary, but at the time it represented a real innovation. This is the V55 580 horsepower diesel engine, which was capable of pushing the T55 along at 50 km per hour on the road and 30 km per hour cross country. Add to this the mounting of the transmission behind the engine, and everything from the engine forward is free space. Inside the turret, the low profile and steeply sloped sides do allow the crew some space, but the headroom is very tight. This, of course, was accepted by the Soviet Army, who had a height limit on tank crewmen. The commander sat here, roughly where I am at the moment, at the rear of the turret to the left. He had his own sight, and just behind me you can see the radio controls. In front of him was the gunner. He had a hand control for traverse and elevation with a firing button on top. You can also see that he had two gun sights, one optical and the other infrared. The loader to the right of the gun may look like he had a lot of room, but remember that there were 100 mm shells stored here each round a metre long. Up front, the driver had conventional controls. Two steering levers, tillers, as we tankies call them, with the gear change on his right.
The first combat outing for the T-54 was in 1956, during the Hungarian Uprising. After that, it was deployed throughout the Warsaw Pact nations and was produced under license in various countries. In the final count, something over 100,000 of all types and derivatives were built, making it the most produced tank ever. Such was the quality of its design and the reliability of its performance that it still crops up to this day, nearly 70 years later, in low-intensity conflicts throughout the Third World.